Welcome back to Truck Tech. I am Alan Adler, the, the Midwest Bureau Chief for Freight Waves. Welcome to another episode of Truck Tech. Today, we're going to take a look at hydrogen in some depth, but mostly we have a couple of questions up front. The first question is, why? And maybe it is the incentives that are coming from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Maybe it's some of the uh, infrastructure money that's coming through. Maybe it is just finally time for hydrogen to make its uh, make its mark in the trucking space. We don't know, but we do have a couple of guests today who are going to help us work through that uh, uh, later in the show. Carrie Mendez, who's the president of uh, Energy at Nikola Corporation, and also uh, Morton Hollum, who is the president of Hexagon Purus. He will join us from Norway, where it's a little later than it is here in the East. But uh, we are glad to have both of them later today. But first, before we get to them, let's get let's hit some headlines. This is a big time for Hino Trucks. They have their first. Uh, U.S. president, that is U.S. born president, Glenn Ellis, uh, succeeds Shigiri Hiro Mat Matsuoka, who has retired. Ellis will be a co officer of the parent company. And while well, Hino is slowly emerging from a data falsification scandal uh, on truck emissions back home in Japan, the U.S. unit makes sells and services a lineup of class four to eight trucks at an assembly plant in West Virginia. Ellis was formerly Hino's senior vice president of customer experience. Trailer maker Wabash is on a roll. Not only is it seen a big jump in its stock price following the announcement of a long-term supply deal with J.B. Hunt Transport in January, the company is getting some props for its inclusion in the Forbes Best Small Companies of 2023 list. Wabash ranked number 100 out of 541 companies on the list, compiled from fact set data over the last 12 months. Qualified companies have to have a market value between $300 million and $2 billion, report positive sales growth over the last 12 months, and have a share price of at least $5. For Wabash, that was a check, check, and check. Wabash is trading near its 52-week high of $30.10. Finally, it's hard to know what to make of natural gas as an alternative to diesel these days. ACT research reports that sales of natural gas-powered vehicles were mixed in September, from in the September to November time period, excuse me, September activity surpassed year ago numbers by 29%, but both October and November fell behind a year ago by 9% each month. At the same time, the number of public natural gas fueling stations is dropping, but renewable uh, natural gas is continuing uh, to rise in availability. RNG is a terrific has a terrific emissions profile uh, because it's made from organics like dairy waste instead of petroleum. The Trillium division of the Love's family of companies is plowing money into developing more RNG making capability. It's also working with Cummins to help customers use alternative fuel and zero emission technologies. So let's stay right there with zero emissions. It's a term that gets thrown around pretty loosely. And while it's true that battery electric trucks have no tailpipe emissions, depending how well, or excuse me, how the electricity they use is made, there can still be a pretty significant well to wheels carbon footprint. It's less true for hydrogen powered fuel cell trucks, whose only emission as a transport fuel anyway, is water vapor. The hydrogen, however, can come in a multitude of colors, green, gray, or one of several others. Each means something different for the environment and transporting hydrogen, say by diesel truck, kind of messes with that zero emission goal too. Today, we'll talk about Nikola's approach to hydrogen with Kerry Mendez, the president of Nikola's energy division. And uh, Mendez has a deep experience in this area in, in energy and renewables. He joined uh, BP's energy trading division in 2003 and held senior positions, global roles, including CEO of BP's US energy trading and marketing division. He led the crude oil trading and global renewable energy team, trading team, and he played a role in BP's renewable energy business, which fits well with his, uh, with his work at Nikola. Also joined from Norway, as I mentioned, by Morten Holum, president of Hexcom Purus. The company partners with global OEMs behind the scenes in developing zero emission truck fuel systems for hydrogen and battery electric trucks. And that includes the hydrogen fuel cylinders and related systems, fuel systems of which uh, we'll find out that Nikola is one of their customers. 
Uh, Holum was appointed in December 2019 to his role. He was formerly the CEO of the Safe Road Group, one of Europe's largest road safety and road infrastructure suppliers. He also held key positions in companies such as Norsa Skog, Norsk Hydro, and American Airlines. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Great to have you. Thank you very much for having us. Good. All right. We're all on the screen. Let's go. Let's have some fun here. I have uh, I have a little something for everybody today. We've got uh, we're going to start out. Carrie, I want to I want to start with you. Uh, Nicola started with battery electric vehicles, which was a departure from the original company plan in the U.S. Uh, to go right to fuel cells. You're delivering beds. You have some backlog of trucks to build. Over time, does um, does does Nicola become primarily a hydrogen fuel cell long haul co- trucking company, or do you see the technologies coexisting? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, Alan. I think, you know, we're kind of led by exactly what our customers want, right? And the customer testing we've done, the feedback we've got from them, uh, really lead us to believe that they do value having two solutions and and being flexible. Uh, Our CEO, Michael Loeschaller, was in Germany at the IAA show just uh, recently in September. And one of the things, the phrases he used, which I love, is, you know, Nikola has two legs uh, in this market. And uh, that really means that for shorter haul um, uh, applications, uh, where a battery electric vehicle is more efficient and customers value that, but there might be another part of their portfolio that actually wants the longer range. Uh, Our FTV truck um, can go up to 500 miles. Um, And so that's another part of the customer that we're trying to serve. So I think uh, in in the long run, um, these are two great solutions for the market. Customers seem to be giving us great feedback and saying, keep both of them in your portfolio. And uh, so we'll see how things evolve in the long term. But for now, I think that's the customer feedback we're hearing. Yeah. Well, and of course, the background suggests that, uh, you know, hydrogen does have a play. You went uh, last week, uh, Nicola announced that it was branding the hydrogen business as Hyla. Um, I'm I'm curious. uh, This was something I think you kind of indicated you had to keep under your hat for about a year that, that this was coming. But how important is it and, and how significant is it to actually brand something like uh, your hydrogen business? You know, I, I think it's very important, right? I, I left uh, my prior company to come here to, 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 in our belief here, we're changing the world. Uh, zero emissions um, um, uh, products, uh, the hydrogen, as well as the trucks. And I think it's important to feel excited about that hydrogen brand. Um, so specifically, we formed the brand Hyla. And in case you're wondering, well, where'd you come up with that name? It's very simple. It's the first two letters of the word hydrogen, high, and then the last two of our of our of our uh, company, uh, Nikola. So Hyla is an exciting brand. Um, I think it's important to brand something that we feel is distinctive. Um, for us, the hydrogen part of the business, which I run, is basically about finding supply, low carbon supply, low cost supply, distribu- dis- distributing it to the customer, and then dispensing it. Once you get all of those three things together and you can offer that to the customer, that dispels a key question, which many of them have, which is, you know, I'm buying this great truck. It has zero emissions, but how do I fuel it? So I'd like to think that Hyla represents a significant step for, for Nikola and for the industry in saying, you don't have to worry about that chicken and egg problem anymore. We think we can give you both solutions. And that dispels their their um, their caution about buying them, because I think at that point they say, well, I can buy this great truck. Um, you know, and and I can get the hydrogen solutions that I need to fuel it. Sure. You have, um, that is Nikola, has several partnerships for hydrogen development. At one time, the company talked about having 700 hydrogen stations. That was going to be quite an undertaking, uh, you know, given that each was, you know, multi-millions of dollars to develop. Now, that's been scaled back to 60 um, by 2026. Can you talk about the rollout? I mean, obviously, California will be first. Where else should we expect to see station development? Yeah, and you know, I think again, we, we're guided by our customers and where they want to buy these trucks, where their fueling routes are. Uh, we're very excited about these 60 stations, right? Uh, and let's just remember, there are really no heavy duty uh, fueling stations out there um, at 700 bar, 10,000 PSI that exist to give the customers this rapid fueling time that they're looking for. So I think uh, for the heavy duty station sector, 60 is, is, a, is a really big um, and, and ambitious goal. And uh, we, we carefully watch our market, uh, we watch our customers and it's underpinned by that. I think uh, what makes sense uh, for us in initial launch markets are jurisdictions where uh, both the society and government and the consumers 
uh, incentivize these early adopters, right? So HVIP in California is a great example. Uh, we are we were just approved on Friday. You may have seen the news release for our uh, fuel cell electric vehicle trucks, the hydrogen trucks, uh, for up to uh, $240,000 a truck. Um, and if you add the uh, advanced clean fuel credit uh, from the federal government un under the Inflation Reduction Act, another $40,000, you are talking about a significant amount of incentives for consumers, for truck buyers to go and buy those trucks. So California makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, you know, uh, Washington, Oregon, I think Canada is an exciting jurisdiction which has similar carbon mandates and incentives, uh, New York and, and, uh, and other states. Uh, I think we're also, as you know, uh, manufacturing our trucks in Germany with our partner Aveco. And the EU and Germany, are, I think, also have very supportive um, uh, carbon mandates and incentives. So those are some examples, I think, very big markets, very supportive markets, where I think our customers can be incentivized to also adopt our technology at an early stage. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, again, just to reiterate, I mean, the incentives are driving the hydrogen business right now. And that's a good thing because it's the closest thing the country really has to an energy policy right now, which is to incentivize the things that you want to see happen. This is still very expensive. You told me the other day that you felt like there might be some investor interest um, in hydrogen in terms of some of the development, things like that. Can you can you elaborate a little? Yeah, you know, I think, look, the, in the U.S. right now, I think the U.S. is the, the center of investor interest in the hydrogen space. And, and very simply put, I think it's progressive policies from the government, progressive uh, policies, local, state, federal. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act was a big deal, right? Uh, passed in late August, September. Um, significant incentives for uh, clean, uh, renewable uh, green hydrogen, uh, for investing in infrastructure, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, up to $3 a kilogram uh, under the PTC. Uh, you get uh, incentives as well for uh, carbon sequestration, so on and so forth. So I think what we've noticed, there's a lot more investor interest in our hydrogen infrastructure ecosystem. Um, and I think that's that's really encouraging. The other message I like to put out there for our investors is, look, this isn't five years or 10 years from now. If you're looking for returns in this space, uh, hydrogen, the term I used at the Hyla event, hydrogen is now. I and mean, we've introduced this really awesome uh, hydrogen mobile fueling uh, solution uh, that allows us to get this out with our customers today. Uh, and we can take that, put it in the, a parking lot, so we can put it behind the fence at one of the logistics centers. So, you know, I think for investors coming in who are looking to deploy capital rapidly in the clean renewable space, Nikola really offers them a demand solution, a clean solution, that, that enables them to monetize their investment. So I would say I've been very encouraged, um, and Nicola has been very encouraged by, by all the interest uh, in this space. And it's really essential, I think. You know, our focus is on building trucks and getting hydrogen out to the market. We really do need partners. It takes a village to build this ecosystem. And I think we're very encouraged to see that interest. Yeah, Morton, I want to turn to you. Uh, your company supplies both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell technologies. Can you talk about Hexacon Purist and maybe your view on the either or versus uh, the and of battery electric and fuel cell te technologies? Yeah, so we believe the future is electric, uh, not just because the uh, it's a zero emission drivetrain, but because it's a superior drivetrain, both from a user perspective, from you know eventually a total cost of ownership perspective. So uh, everything that runs on diesel today will be powered by electrons in the future. Um, the uh, you have you have two platforms, right? Hydrogen electric and battery electric, and those technologies are actually quite similar. Uh, one stores the, uh, all the energy as electrons in the battery. And for the fuel cell truck, some of the energy is stored in the battery and, and some are stored as hydrogen molecules uh, in, in cylinders and then converted to electrons uh, through the fuel cell. So, and each of those technologies has, it pro has its uh, pros and cons. So, and which one you choose will depend on your duty cycle what range you need, what payload you need, what sort of environment and operating pattern you use, terrain, um, temperature, and so forth. So, and, and of course, battery electric vehicles are, has the most efficient use of energy. And if your duty cycle allows it, this is probably the one you should choose. But the two main disadvantages of batteries is that they're heavy and they take a long time to charge. So, um, 
in some applications, that's okay. You know, if you have short range, you have light loads, you know, carry things like potato chips, um, and you have a back-to-base uh, duty cycle where you can trickle charge uh, the truck at night, then, you know, it works perfectly. But you go into the longer ranges, um, the heavier payloads, uh, continuous use, then you need hydrogen. Uh, and hydrogen gives you what you don't get with batteries. You get the longer range and you get the fast refueling time. So, uh, you know, for long haul trucking, line haul, it's just not practical to stop charging uh, your truck every three, four hours for, you know, uh, a few hours at a time. So, and I think there is a wide range of duty cycles that a truck needs to cover. And there is no one of those technologies that will be perfect for all of those duty cycles. So, so um, it's, it's uh, definitely not an e- either or uh, from our perspective. We're quite firm in our belief that both of these technologies uh, are highly relevant and, and needed. Does it seem to either of you that, that maybe some of that, I'll call, I'll call it hater, some of that hater mentality is, is dissipating a little bit? I mean, it seems like hydrogen is getting a bit more respect um, these days. It isn't, it isn't sort of uh, as a certain head of a company or multiple companies calls it fuel cells, uh, you know, for, for fuel cells. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be getting that kind of vibe these days. Is that your sense as well, or are you still running into people who just say, well, it's got to be one. I mean, you know, Volkswagen, for example, you know, really favors uh, battery electric for everything and, and, you know, is working hard towards that. I think they've got a few fuel cell projects as a hedge. But by and large, uh, do you sense that people are accepting both now? Yeah, from my perspective, there's a, you know, there's a natural skepticism where something new comes along. And particularly for the OEMs who have a lot of, you know, a lot of legacy business, uh, that they also need to protect. And, uh, and so, you know, and part of the skepticism goes, you know, towards, well, you don't get the same range or it's much higher cost or it's just, you know, it's this or that or the other. Um, and fair enough, uh, there is some healthy skepticism. So, you know, uh, things like where is the hydrogen going to come from? There isn't enough, you know, uh, for mass adoption today. And so I think that there is also some healthy skepticism. And then you have as we talk to the OEMs, it's, it's also hard to, uh, to focus. I think we saw a few years ago that there was really a pivot towards the battery electric technology simply because they are A, more mature, and then B, you have things like the, um, you know, the car ruling in California, which mandates zero emission um, technologies or zero emission trucks already from 2024. And it's, it's hard also to push both technologies at the same time. So, um, yeah. so I think uh, yeah. I think it's natural uh, that that people think a bit differently about it. But overall, I think as time goes by, it becomes more and more uh, something that people um, evaluate properly and see that you know there is no way back. There is only a way forward, and the internal combustion engine over time, you know, has no place in that. And so, yeah. yeah. And I think I would Carrie, add, you know, the, go ahead, Carrie, go ahead. Alan, yeah. if I could add, I think the other pressing thing, which we all have lived now over the last two years, COVID, geopolitical uncertainty, the Ukraine war, volatility in oil and gas prices, which we've never seen. I think energy security is a really big deal. And I think whether it's battery or hydrogen, those do give you the opportunity to have, uh, you know, homegrown solutions that add to your energy independence. Um so I think beyond the societal concerns around carbon emissions and, and getting to a, 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 you know, a, a safer planet, a cleaner planet, I think uh, it, hydrogen, battery, other types of renewable sources uh, that don't depend on, on extraneous forces and are disrupted, I think do offer a, a pretty compelling alternative. And we've seen, especially in Europe, you know, a, a real change in attitudes towards both hydrogen, electric and other renewable sources. Yeah, I mean, very quickly, Kerry, I, I mentioned at the top of the show that there's lots of colors for hydrogen. You've got some green efforts underway. You've got some gray, as in broken out of, uh, uh, out of natural gas uh, coming, uh, things like that. Is this a progression? Is there some kind of chart on a wall at Nikola that says, here's how we get to X percent of green hydrogen by this date? Or is it possible even know that? 
Yeah, you know, and I think right now, I think as you get through this transition from fossil fuels, I think there's, you know, there's, as you said, gray, blue, pink, uh, green. I think what matters to us is how do we get the carbon intensity of the hydrogen to what our customers want, right? And I think each one of them have ESG mandates uh, that they have to uh, achieve, emissions mandates, scope one, scope two, scope three. So uh, we look at it and say, in, in, for example, with blue hydrogen, you know, there's ways that you can sequester the carbon and you can get the carbon intensity down to uh, where it matches what the federal government and other governments are looking to incentivize. Similarly, with, with if you're looking to do electrolysis through renewable electricity, I think one key issue is, you know, um, where can you get those renewable sources of power? Are they building up? So I think when we do some deep analysis around this, uh, and we're working with our partners, we really like to, to kind of look at the carbon intensity and then match that up with the costs and incentives and give the customer the solution they want. I think the important thing is that there's many solutions out there across the spectrum um, that get people to the, uh, the carbon intensity that meets their goals. Yeah. Um, let me say, Kerry, one, one other thing. You know, I noticed and we had some pictures of your mobile hydrogen fueling. You actually have the same thing for electric trucks through uh, Tritium. Um, is this a transitional approach until we see a robust uh, public charging infrastructure? Or do you think mobile is a uh, part of the long term answer for for uh, both electric and uh, battery electric and hydrogen? Yeah, I, I very much think it's it's part of the long-term solution, and I think it's probably even more important now, as you know, uh, uh, as both on the mobile power charging and as mobile hydrogen, as you have public infrastructure that's catching up, right? And so I think right now what it does is it allows customers to get hydrogen fueling for their trucks now rather than waiting, as I said before. So that's a great uh, leap forward for them. I think in the long term you will have more fixed stations uh, come come on board and more fixed uh, electric charging infrastructure. But I think there will always be last mile fueling that mobile chargers can provide hard to fuel locations or, or growing markets that there'll be a solution of. So I think uh, the flexibility is the key thing we like about uh, the mobile charging uh, solutions. Sure. Morton, you uh, in January opened, I don't know if it was a brownfield or a greenfield facility uh, or expanded. You can explain that uh, in Maryland. Um, but obviously you see some long-term growth here for the tanks that you're making. And maybe you can talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, we see a very large potential for growth and we're scaling up uh, our operation, uh, increasing the capacity in uh, anticipation, um, expectation and preparation for, for much higher customer demand. So in Maryland, the uh, Westminster facility is, is one small part of that. We're actually also um, building a large greenfield cylinder production facility in Germany uh, and also in China. So, uh, and we're building a much bigger footprint than we need today, so we can easily slot in additional production lines um, as the market expands. So, and I think Nikola is incredibly important uh, in this. Uh, you, you know, we need the companies to, to take the lead and to show the way. Uh, and as a startup, you're willing to take risks that uh, the legacy OEMs uh, are not willing to take. Uh, apparently, you know, they have a legacy business to lose, which, which Nikola um, doesn't have. And so, but it helps to drive the behavior of the other uh, OEMs because they need to respond. And I think sure. the... Uh, Tesla is, uh, you know, is a very relevant analogy, right? The... Passenger vehicle OEMs, they, uh, I don't think they took Tesla seriously. It took a long time for them to react and respond. And, um, you know, now 10 years later, um, they're several years behind in, the, in, in their own development. And uh, on the truck side, the legacy truck OEMs, uh, I think uh, what I hear is that they're determined not to make that same mistake as the past sure. car uh, OEMs did. Um, so, so all of them are working on their own battery electric and fuel cell electric platforms. But, you know, uh, Nikola is the first one out there, first one out of right. the gate. And, um, yeah, that, that, that's important. And I think in, in, in the grand scheme of things, right, this will take time. And, and I think it's going to take longer time uh, than we actually think. It's quite, it's building up a whole new ecosystem where you know you need the renewable energy, you need the green hydrogen production, you need distribution, you need um, the refueling network, you need the vehicle technologies, and 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 that isn't built in 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 one to two years. So, uh, right. but the right. logic, the logic is super strong, and the momentum is tremendous. 
on all fronts. Yeah. And I, I think mm -hmm. if we have a little bit of perspective, as humans, we tend to overestimate the rate of change in the short term. We think things are going to sure. happen much sooner than they do. But if you well, actually I, look I, I, on... I, I, on yeah, I've got to cut you off. I'm really sorry. We're, we're under a minute left. I wanted to ask one more question. Oh. We'll catch that one next time. But I, I, I want to thank you both for being with me today. I uh, Just briefly, next week on Truck Tech, we'll talk about powertrains from A to Z with Jose Sampiero, Cummins' new executive director and general manager of the North American on-highway business. Maybe a second guest. We'll see about that. This Friday in Truck Tech, the newsletter will update the progress and the scaling of hydrogen making electrolyzers, which were mentioned here briefly. They are key to fueling the fuel cells like we discussed today. You can subscribe to Truck Tech for delivery by email or read it online at freightwaves.com. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week.